Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, Everything About DNS You Never Dared to Ask. Hi. My name is Ole. I'm from Hamburg. I work at DNS Simple and um, other, as stated at the intro slide, I'm not the co-founder of DNS Simple. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a regular software engineer. But today, I want to pitch you my new startup idea. And as you know, every new startup it starts with a problem. So you know that problem? You're hungry, but you just ate. So I know that problem. And I think the perfect solution to this would be pizza and chocolate, but you know, combined. So what, what about frozen chocolate pizza? I think this is a billion dollar idea. Um, and the idea is we sell frozen chocolate pizza online and send it to people. I think we can get rich with this, um, <laughs> but don't steal it. So in order to start this business, and the first thing everyone, every business does is register a domain. So we need a domain for this. And luckily, I know a pretty cool company where you can register and manage your, manage your domains online. So we want to sell chocolate pizza. So I think the most obvious domain name would be www.chocolate-chocolate.pizza. Right? I think that's pretty cool. Um, that's pretty straightforward, and as far as I know, it would rank pretty high on Google, too. But how does, how does that work? How does registering a domain even work? Like, what is, what is happening there? So, in order to explain this concept, you need to know about the three R's of domain, re um, domain registration and domain management. The first R is the registrant. This is us in the example because we are the registrant of the domain. A registrant always talks to a registrar, and the registrar usually helps registry selling domain names to customers. So you always need a registrar. There's no way to directly talk to a registry. And then the registrar for us talks to the registry. So the registry is responsible to talk, uh, the, reg the registrar is, is responsible to talk to the different registries. So DNS Symbol is a registrar as well, so I know like, what's going on behind the scenes, and I found it pretty interesting, so I want to share that with you. The communication usually um, works over the extensible provisioning protocol, EPP, that's specified in RFC 7330. It's XML-based, and when they say extensible, it's really extensible. So that's just the bare minimum set of, of stuff that's defined in this protocol. And most registries define their own set of so-called extensions on their own. So you usually end up implementing the same feature for different registries in different extensions. EPP defines a set of um, multiple entities. So first we have domains, we have hosts, and we have contacts. So these are the three entities when you think about domain management and domain registrations. Each of these entities can be um, requested or can be altered by different commands. So there are query and transform commands. And a query command, for example, is a check, an info, a poll, or a transfer. And as the name suggests, query commands don't alter data. They just retrieve information from the registry. And there are transform commands like create, delete, renew, transfer, update, which do alter the state at the registry. And these commands do not necessarily have to be sync, right? You send the request, you get a response, but the response can be like pending. And each of these commands can be used for each of the resources. So how these commands work on the domain entity is specified in RFC 7371 in the domain name mapping. There's the host mapping and also contact mapping. Each of these is a different RFC, and it contains you know, all the nitty-gritty details, what a check domain on a contact does differently than a check command on the domain. How does this look like? Here you see an example case for a request in the EPP protocol that would probably not work because it does not have any extensions in there. 
um, to register frozen dash chocolate dot pizza. So you see over here, that's the domain name specified. Here you see the domain period we want to register. And also here you see the name servers we want to set. And here you already see a hint that a host in EPP is usually linked to name servers, but it's a more broader concept. So, and it's poor naming. <laughs> uh, you also see the registrant, and you see the different contacts here with the with their various types. And this um, these identifiers here are just linking to the contact identity. And here you also see the domain auth info, which you may know as auth code when you transfer a domain. So these auth codes are usually set by your registrar and can be set and altered by your registrar as well. And yes, that's all plain text. <laughs> so who are we talking to? Like I, I was saying and stating we are sending the request, but where, where do we send the request to? So in order to answer this question, we need to look at the domain name again. But specifically, we need to look at the very end, so at .pizza. You may heard about this, um, this ending of a domain as a so-called top-level domain. But well, actually, it's an effective top-level domain. This is not the effective or ETLD concept. It's nothing that's specified somewhere. It's more like a best practice in the field of domain management. Because an effective TLD basically represents what is a top-level domain in the, in the sense of, of top-level domains and tasks that are connected to top-level domains. Because top-level domain, by, speci by, spe by the specification, is always the last bit after the last dot. But when we talk about registries, CoUK has its own registry. Also, COMAU, and there's also DEVU. You might know this from, <laughs> from when the internet started. <laughs> um, this is not an ETLD. This is just a product. Um, and as you can see here, TLDs and no, ETLDs cannot be parsed. There's no set of rules that you could apply to a domain name to parse out an effective TLD. So what the internet community as a whole do or does is we are maintaining a big text file of ETLDs. And this is used across Mozilla, Google, um, DNS Simple, Komodo, and VeriSign, and multiple more. We all share this manually maintained list of effective TLDs. Um, so you can see that's already quite inefficient. And there are different variants of these TLDs. There are country code TLDs that belong to a specific state or country, like the E for Germany, ES for Spain, FR is France, ES, Iceland, US is actually the United States, uh, because .com is not a country code TLD. There's also SC for the Seychelles. Um, what's funny about this, these domains is that you can't register it with an API. You need to walk into an office and sign a form on the Seychelles. And AF is Afghanistan, which is also particularly funny and one of the really weird things on the internet is that you need to put 10 bucks in an envelope and send it to Afghanistan to register your domain. <laughs> and then there's the generic TLDs, so the GTLDs. So there's .com, there's org, NGO, um, .info, like all of these are generic TLDs that does not belong to a country and that exist for quite a long time. So they were like made um, the pre-new icon TLDs, which we are talking about next. That's the new GTLDs. And the ICANN, and we talk about the ICANN in more detail later, decided that we need to broaden up the domain, name, the domain name space because there are so many people that want to get online and they want to have their own name that the like, amount of sensible characters we can put behind a TLD is just getting like tinier and tinier. So they came up with the idea that everyone can register their own GTLD. So we have things like .best, .capital, .app. We have IDN stuff that I can read out loud. Um, we have local um, domain names, local TLDs like .hamburg. And also we have .pizza. So this is what you want to look at. So frozen chocolate dot pizza, and this was the question you want to answer, right? Who who are we talking to? So frozen chocolate dot pizza, or specifically dot pizza, belongs to the Donuts domain registry. Donuts is a startup in, from the United States. They are founded around 2010, and their own 
business, the sole business purpose was to apply for new GTLDs. So they now own over 240 GTLDs, and they're one of the fastest growing companies in the US. There are also multiple others, like Verisign, who own .com. Um, there's PIR, the public interest registry. They own .org and NGO, for example. There's Circa, which is Canadian then, and there's also DENIC, which you may have heard of, which is the German um, registry. And now, as I said, you may wonder how are new G D GTLDs made? So there's flowers and bees, um, <laughs> but this is not how domains are made, so let's give them some privacy. <laughs> Actually, new GTLDs are made at the ICANN, or with the ICANN. So the ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It's the technical manage or they're responsible for the technical management of DNS root zones and also IP address spaces. Um, give me a second here. So the ICANN is um, consists or the the ICANN advisory committee has representatives from 111 states. 108, 108 UN members, the Holy See, Cook Island, New Taiwan, Hong Kong, Bermuda, Montserrat, uh, the European Commission, and the African Union Commission. So as you can see, basically the whole world has a state, uh, has a stake in, in the ICANN and has a handle in there because we want the internet to be like a global project and we want, to w we want it to work across the globe. So how can you register your own GTLD? I mean, you can, can imagine you want to have your, your own GTLD, right? This could be, could be pretty fun if I could have .ole, for example. So first, you need to apply for the GTLD at ICANN for only $185,000, 5000 in cash. Uh, so this is where most of us maybe get out of the process, <laughs> myself included. Um, and you need to provide the following. So you need to provide a proof of legal establishment, uh, which I could provide because I'm a freelancer, so I can check that box at least. <laughs> um, and I would need to um, provide the financial statements, which is an eight-sheet Excel file provided by ICANN you need to fill, which is basically uh, covering uh, eight, eight different scenarios of how your domain sale goes. And you need to provide the numbers, you es est estimate and also the prices you want to you want to set for your domains for renewal and transfer then when your tld represents a community so let's say i want to have dot ruby or dot js i would need a community endorsement i think this is particularly interesting because think about these examples like i want to have i want to register dot js how could i get this community like an official community endorsement like who who should give you that? Um, I think that's, that's an interesting question, and I don't have answers for that. Um, if you have a, a TLD that connects in some, some ways to a government, like .hamburg or .berlin, you would need government approval or government support, or at least non-objection. And also, if, you, if your financial statements suggest that you will have high traffic and high operational costs, you will need to document your third-party funding commitments. And most interestingly, for like high-tension high domains, like .app, for example, I think that's the most well-known um, well example, there were multiple companies competing for it. There was Apple, Google, Amazon. They all wanted to have .app. So the procedure called string contention was entered at ICANN, which is basically an auction. And that app was sold for multiple billion US dollars. And these dollars all go to ICANN. And if, I, if you were competing around that app, you would get a split of this multi-billion just because you entered and applied, because you don't get your vacation fee back. Um, I think that's pretty funny. So they made a good win out of that. Then you would need to pass the extended ICANN evaluation, um, which is basically just going over what we just provided. And then you simply manage and operate your own registry infrastructure, including authoritative name service, who is, and a simple registry service, um, and profit. <laughs> so you don't want to do this your own, right? I mean, forget the idea of having your own first name as a TLD. This just doesn't work unless you're super rich and have a lot of resources. 
But as I mentioned, all this money that is made in the auctions and with the applications for new GTLDs, it generates a really weird problem in the domain name space, which leads to headlines like this. So I can once help where to spend your money because they're a nonprofit and they have so, like, this is real. This was October 9th this year, and they want, they want help how to spend the money. Um, <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. But what was about our request? I mean, we were, we were sending out the request to register frozen chocolate or pizza, and what, what was happening with that? So the registry, Donuts, finally responded to us. So we got the EPP response, and here you see the command completed successfully. Um, here we have the domain, so the domain name. We also have the creation date and the expiration date. We will talk about domain registration and domain expiration later, briefly too. So yay, cool, we did that. We have our own domain. But <laughs> wait, so frozen chocolate.pizza, and you notice that by me just trying to spell out loud multiple times, is really hard to pronounce. And also, like for my new awesome startup, I don't want to put the focus on the frozen part. So actually, I like chocolate.pizza. I mean, that'd be really neat. But wait a second, chocolate.pizza obviously is already taken. So I can't just get it the same way I just registered frozen chocolate pizza. But fortunately, you can just have it for 1,130 euros, which is um, 995 Great British Pounds on the aftermarket. So this was an actual search I did on Sedo, their uh, uh, domain aftermarket place, aftermarket marketplace, uh, where you can buy registered domain and make offer offers. So this domain is actually purchasable, and I will not spend the money, so if you want to do that, please do. <laughs> So in order, let's, let's pretend I want to spend over a thousand bucks for a stupid domain. How would I get it? So how does a domain transfer work? And this process is quite complex. So I want to go over this process with you step by step and hope you will not get overwhelmed by the final picture. This process starts with us, the registrar. Uh, the registrant, sorry. And the registrant re requests the transfer at the gaining registrar. So I go to my registrar and say, I want to move this domain. So all of this process is documented, like is, this is copied from ICANN, right? This is not reflecting the real world, <laughs> but this is how I can imagine the process. Um, so it has some weird nudges in there. Um, so the gaining registrar needs to direct you to the OS code and how to unlock a domain, which you need to do at the losing registrar. And the losing registrar needs to provide you the means to get the auth code and unlock the domain. So you see the, the language is really wibbly wobbly and they don't want to be very specific here because they don't want to limit the business cases and the, the, yeah, the, the business cases you can have around domain management. So then the gaining registrar can go ahead and fetch the whois data. And with this whois data, they send the FOA, that's the form of authorization, to the registered name holder or administrative contact. So that's a really a PDF. It's literally a PDF. Um, you can download it, I can. And then they have to send it to you on the email address they found in Whois. So this is why you should always disable Whois privacy when you want to transfer a domain, or at least pre-May this year. And then when you sign this one and the gaining registrar has the signed form of approval or form of authorization, they can go ahead with the auth code you provided to them and initiate the transfer at the registry. I think that's a very solid representation of registry. So the, <laughs> the registry then, and I kid you not, this is like the language of the ICANN, sends an e-notice to both registrars. <laughs> So with this e-notice sent, the losing registrar has notice of the domain being transferred out. And then the losing registrar has the option to acknowledge or not acknowledge this request. But as you know, most companies don't really care about customers that leave them. And usually they don't act at all. And what happens is that after seven days, the ICANN forces an auto act. So a domain is usually transferred after seven days. This affects the transfer. I just mentioned May this year. And as everyone interested in legal stuff <laughs> knows, 
Um, GDPR hits us, and this is basically nonsense now because you can request who is data, but who is data is just, it's empty usually. So here, and that's really funny. I mean, we all rely on this, and this is official documentation, and this is the way it needs to work. Like, this is how I can want you to work, but this just doesn't work <laughs> because European law like was it basically was conflicting with ICANN law, right? So everyone at ICANN was really freaking out, so they were signing a paper last minute that you now can just skip this step. And at the moment, in the ICANN and the ITF and the registry registrar group, we are working on creating a new process that is also way more secure. But remember, now that you learned this, and for my own, um, for my own benefit as working as at a registrar, please always start your transfers on time and don't start it two days prior expiration and then write us in support that you really need this done. Um, because a transfer can take up to seven days and in most cases will take up that long. And when you're talking to ComAU, it may even take a month. So we, wanted, we were talking about chocolate pizza, right? So what, what do we need to do to make this happen and get ourselves into money rain? Well, that's fairly easy. We just need to pack it up and send it to our customers. But this is not just, right? There needs to be, there needs to be some more. So there needs to be more stuff. So how can we send it out, right? And I'm not, I will not talk about postal services, but I want to talk about set up setting up an online store, right? I, I need my domain, chocolate pizza, to work. And as you may know, the internet works on IP addresses and lots of other duct tape, but also IP addresses. So <laughs> we need our browsers to understand and translate chocolate.pizza into an IP address. So how does this work? How is this done? And this is done by the domain name system, the DNS system. And two things that are hard in computer science is naming and caching, as you all know. So I want to welcome you to the world of DNS. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And you all probably already had a case where you had a set up a record that was wrong and that was cached for 24 hours. Uh, we have seen like fabulous, famous, big websites failing just about that. And you know what the funny part about this? You can't do anything. Like I've seen companies tweeting out and going on Facebook and, and proposing a different URL to the main website because they screwed it up. So it's really important to understand what's, what's happening there. And it's so funny to see so many engineers struggle with this. And I say this as someone who struggled with this and who took already a website down with this. Um, but this was prior to my work at the InSimple. So one hand DNS knowledge. Just a really, really short cab about the protocol because I don't want to like, you probably are not going to implement your own DNS resolver because that's pain. Uh, so we don't need to talk about the specifics of the protocol. So the protocol is usually UDP. Uh, it's like in the specification, you can do both. But in real life, it's mostly UDP. It's a binary protocol, which I found remarkable because it's, it's fairly old. So they had the performance considerations even back then, like 30 years ago. As mentioned, it's not encrypted. And if you are really curious about this part, um, I hope to get a lot of good questions at the Q&A later. It is defined across 50, 52 different RFCs since um, 1983. And when you implement your own DNS resolver, as we did, and implement all of them, your resolver won't work. <laughs> um, this is because like this, what's actually working in the internet is different what's in the RFCs. And the I ITF knows about this and try to re-standardize. But what <laughs> most people in the domain industry like know and follow is the Power DNS DNS test suite. So as soon as you pass this test suite with your resolver or your name server, um, you're good to go and set a life. I mean, we still every once in a while see, see refused like DNS queries. So it's as every other protocol sometimes broken, but this is just an, in, inherently in, in software, I think. And also, and this is basically just because I need to get the handful. Um, it also can resolve IP addresses to host names. It can do like various other things. Um, we will not talk about different record types, um, so there's way more. But we wanted to talk about how DNS works. So this process starts 
with the process. <laughs> so you have a process, and let's say that's the browser process. And it's not the Chrome process, because Chrome works again differently, and let's not dig into that. So the browser wants to know what's the IP address of chocolate.pizza. And in real life, and this is just a simplification, the browser would ask the operating system. Again, Chrome won't, but usually they will. And then the operating system has its own caching mechanism. <laughs> and then we'll look up the IP, and if it doesn't find it, it'll send it to your local resolver. So you have mostly seen it in your, um, in your DNS settings or your network settings. You set a resolver. Many of you set it to maybe the Google one, so 8888, or maybe the Cloudflare one, 1111. Um, and again, if you're interested in, in security and privacy considerations, um, I love to talk about this in the FAQ later. So we now have this resolver. And the resolver wants to know how to resolve this IP, uh, how to resolve this domain into an IP address. So we first need to look at the root server. And the root knows where is .pizza. Like, who is responsible for the .pizza zone, for this top-level TLD? But have you ever wondered who is operating, who's operating this root service? So the ICANN has 30 different root servers globally distributed, and each of them operated by their own independent um, company. I take this as a no. <laughs> so let's look at them, because I found it really interesting when I saw this for the first time. I saw this at an ICANN meeting, and all of this happens in the public. Like All of this that I'm telling you now is not happening behind closed doors. right? So one root server is, or the first one is, operated by VeriSign. There's one that's um, operated by the University of Southern California. There's Kogan Communications, which I have never heard of before, but apparently it's a multinational ISP based in the United States. There's um, the University of Maryland. There's NASA. There's the Internet Systems Consortium which is a Delaware-registered nonprofit corporation that supports the open internet, <laughs> according to Wikipedia, whatever that means. There's uh, the US Department of Defense, the US Army. There's uh, NetNote. NetNote is a nonprofit, natural and independent internet infrastructure organization based in Sweden. There's uh, VeriSign, so there go our 13 independent operators, and it's only 12, because one just got broke and there was no one to replace it. <laughs> And that's RIPE. Uh, RIPE is pretty interesting because there's like all the others and RIPE. And RIPE is a regional internet registry, the RAR for Europe, West Africa, the former USSR, and it's headquartered in Amsterdam with the branch office in Dubai. So that's basically the representation of the rest of the world. There's ICANN. And then there's the White Project, which is an internet project in Japan founded by the KU University, the Tokyo Institute of Technology, and the University of Tokyo. So, how is your feeling about that? So when I saw the list for the first time, I was like, what? <laughs> Shit. Um, I mean, we're talking about the open internet, and almost everything of this is controlled by the US. Um, I'm pretty uncomfortable with this when we have the orange clown over there. Um, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> well, uh, I don't feel empowered to do anything about this. Um, but I think one, one thing I could do is just telling you about it, and then you also freaking out about it. Um, this may help. <laughs> so let's get back to a resolver that is really hardly trying to answer this question, like what the heck is the IP address for chocolate pizza? So the root servers, one of the US controlled servers, told us that for dot pizza, there's a name server. So there's one name server that's responsible for all the zones that live within dot pizza. So we can ask that name server, here, what is the authoritative name server for this zone? So in DNS, we don't talk about domain names, we talk about zones. And there's like, it, it's a different concept, and we even internally discuss this a lot, but when you talk about it, just talk talking about zones and just like hold them equally, and once you start separating them in different mind processes, it's easier because you name them differently already. Um, so this is a zone, and the name server can tell us where we can look up the zone. So who was operating again the, the TLD name service? Yes, for, for .pizza, it's donuts, right? So just remember that. 
So here you see the backlink of where the domain name system reaches into DNS, right? Because basically they're pretty separated. This is just one of the handover points. So get back to our resolver. <laughs> he still doesn't have an answer, so he still doesn't know <laughs> where's chocolate.pizza. And they made a good travel, and he made a good travel ready. So we know, and the .pizza name server told us that the authoritative name server for this is in our example, it's ns1.dn. Simple.com, it could be obviously any authoritative name server. And then we have the same question. We ask the authoritative name server the same question, but as this one is the authoritative name server, they have an answer. So they just know the IP address. So this IP address is now known to our resolver, and resolver can finally go back to our process and tell the IP, and we now know what to connect to. This whole process should happen in nanoseconds, because you don't want to wait that long. And in order to make this happen, and DNS is a globally distributed protocol, and you don't want to wait for your package, because our name servers are distributed um, in six different regions, for example, and you don't want your request to travel to the next pop that we have, which from here is, is Amsterdam, but um, still, you want this question to be answered very quickly, so this is why Almost all of the different, different actors you have seen in this have their own cache. So once they see a response to a certain question, they cache it in respect to the time, of, uh, time to live the TTL set on a specific record or on the TLD. So the higher you go in the hierarchy, the higher the cache values are. So the time to live for dot pizza for the name server, they are probably pretty high. And when you go like further down and further down, like to your, to your machines and your, your network, you may set it as low as, as an hour or 30 seconds. Um, if you want to read the full story, it's um, how DNS works. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's a six series animated episode we made um, to educate how DNS works. It also answers questions like, wait, how can you call, if I want to resolve dnsimple.com, how can I call ns1.dnsimple.com? Think about that. Um, I, leave, I leave this question to the comic. But it's fairly late, it's um, half past five, you probably want to go home, so I'm sorry, we can't finish the chocolate pizza story. But if you've read the abstract, I promised you one last thing, and this one last thing is the answer to the question, how can you transfer your domain without downtime? And this is, this is a case and a question I, I receive a lot, and with all the knowledge you just gained and the fact that you learned that the domain name system and the DNS system are two different things, you will change your name servers first. So you go to your current registrar, set the name servers to your new registrar, wait until all of this works, and then you start over and transfer your actual domain because transferring a domain, again, takes really, really long and may take up to a week. And if your website is down during the migration because registries like to fuck up, um, you won't have to wait for seven days. Um, again, I'm working for DN Simple. We are DNS automation, um, automation management company. We have a nice UA, nice UI, but our focus is a really cool HTTP modern REST API. So you can automate all your DNS needs. Um, I don't want to like, talk about this too long. If you want to know more about this, come, come later talk to me. We have a lot of awesome stickers. I placed them all on this table, so I want to encourage you to just come down, talk to me, grab a sticker or a t-shirt, and that's all I got. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions, um, if you have any. Every root server sh shares the same data, and it's uh, any cast. So they, they implement, it's the implementator's choice. So every machine ships with this fixed list of different root servers, and the IP address is also specified. And then you can do round robin or just random and try to get an answer. Or you can also ask all of them in parallel and see who answers first. Like there's no, there's no rule set. It's just a fallback, so you can pick any. What's that?
Yes. Yes, that's possible. Yeah. There was another question. Yeah. <laughs> well, they they probably would want to have a spot. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So the question is like, what happens if someone withdraws from the root server list? Um, I don't know. It's managed by the ICANN and IANA. Which is like the organizational organization, um, the the not technical part. Like they do more the organizational and the policy part, and uh, there probably is a policy for that, and I don't know that. Yeah, the ICANN, ICANN, and especially Yana are the the elders of the internet. Yeah, they manage everything together with the ITF for the protocol implementations. But what I also learned. Like while I was digging into into all of this, is that all of this happens in public? Like if there's an ICANN meeting close to your town, you can go there. Like we met, <laughs> we met randos at this conference as well, but we also met really nice people that are just like curious and and making systems better and making the internet a better place. So you can go there and have your voice heard. Are there more questions? Oh, a bunch of them. Uh, let's start at the the front, the red shirt. Yeah. 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 So when you don't have um, DNSSEC applied, you it's UDP, right? So you send out a thing to the internet, and you just trust on whatever sends you back. Like you get an answer, and you have no way other than trusting what you just received. Um, the solution to this is DNSSEC, uh, which basically signs requests, so you would know at least what you get back is is what you were asking for, <laughs> really. <laughs> And then the other, I just like continue on this. Um, maybe I'm answering another question around uh, another question around that. Is it's unencrypted, and you send all of this to your favorite Google resolver, like I did it eight, and it's unencrypted, right? So you basically expose by intent all of the sites you're browsing to, and they claim they don't do anything and they don't cross match it, but Facebook uses your your two-factor auth SMS code for matching, so I <laughs> don't trust any of them. Uh, but I mean, I, I still use it from time to time. But <laughs> yeah, just know what you're getting into. <laughs> Make educated decisions. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you receive the the remaining time usually. So when you make a query and you get an answer, the TTL is not the original TTL; it's the TTL left. So you would need to uh, you would need to uh, um, query the auth rate of name server, which usually don't cache, um, and then you would need to compare, and then you would know how long how stale a record is. But when you receive a record from from someone or from a uh, a resolver from a public resolver, you only get the TTL that's left. So when you use a tool like Dig, you may know this, um, you always get the time that's left. Cool. More, yeah? Um, yeah. Can I elaborate on the NSX question? Well, no. Um, and this is just because I don't know enough of this to make, I would need to make false claims. Um, there's one thing that I use a lot to like educate myself and I like to share this with you because I think it's fairly interesting. Um, so this is probably not for your eyes. Um, oh, it's not, you don't see anything, that's good. Uh, <laughs> hello. Yeah. Okay, oder die andere Seite? Da, guck mal. Ich sehe meine Maus nicht. Nein? Ah, cool. Alright, um, so this is a tool called um, DNSWiz. I mean, it's not an, it's not an, it doesn't explain really what's happening there, um, but it, it basically gives you all the debugging information on um, the root signing. So DNSSEC is basically that you receive a, an answer to a query, and this answer is signed by the entity that's above above what you're currently querying. So the simple.com is signed by .com. And there are DS records uh, used for that, and 
like we use this tool a lot. It's also open um, where you can see which record signs and if a signage is valid or not. Right? And this is basically like the farthest I want to, I can comfortably go, go down there. Cool. Do we have more questions? Yeah? Uh, I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> um, I think I think it would be really hard to do that, um, because there like there are a lot of them, there are many of them, and also there are multiple IPs on this very on this name. So that's you have I think three IPs per root server, and then these IPs are usually routed per any cast. So you have multiple points of presence. Um, I don't know about a case, at least. Yeah. Cool. Uh, one last question, if anyone has one. Cool. Um, then I don't want to be the last one between you and home and the end of the conference. So thank you very much. Come here, grab a sticker. Um, <laughs> goodbye.